The Norman host charged hard against the steel and shields of their enemies, but the sheer ferocity of the English response had driven them back. Now, knights and men fled in a blind panic down the ridge, spurred on by rumours that their leader, Duke William of Normandy, was dead. It was around this crucial stage in the battle that Odo, brother of the Conqueror, rode among the jittery men, stiffening their resolve, at least according to the most famous account of the battle we have, which was probably commissioned by him, the Bio Tapestry. In this video we consider the life of reputedly the most powerful man in England for a time, second only to William the Conqueror himself, the King's half-brother and companion at Hastings, Bishop Odo of Bayeux. Odo was born around 1030 or 31 as the elder son of Haloun de Conteville, a minor nobleman in Normandy, and more importantly, her laver. The latter had previously sired another son out of wedlock, with Robert the Magnificent, Duke of Normandy, in around 1027, who would go on to become William the Conqueror of England. Crucially and perhaps not surprisingly, Haloun supported the young William throughout his shaky minority and early years, ensuring that as the bastard's fortunes rose, so did those of his half-brother, Odo. In 1049, just two years after his bastard brother secured Normandy for himself at the Battle of Validun, Odo took his clerical vows and was installed by William as the Bishop of Bayeux. This move illustrates the great trust that William had placed in his brother, the bishopric being the most prestigious of those in Normandy, granting a degree of power to the ambitious Odo, while cleverly placing a trusted lieutenant in a position where he could keep the rebellious lords around Bayeux in line. Despite his holy exterior, however, Odo was not content with a life of quiet self-reflection and prayer, and would actually have been given an extensive education in arms and statecraft, as with all young men of the ruling class. Odo personally controlled a retinue of around 120 knights and men-at-arms, using these to provide his brother with military service in his many domestic and border conflicts, while also serving as a staff officer for the Duke himself. In peacetime, he also sat on judicial panels. By the age of 30, Odo was certainly a trusted member of the Ducal inner circle, Odo was almost certainly involved in the strategic planning behind Duke William's construction of a fleet with which to invade England in 1066, with the bishop himself providing anywhere between 40 and 100 of the thousand vessels used. A credible theory is that Odo sought the advice of Italian nobles who had knowledge of Byzantine shipbuilding techniques, which included ships for transporting the famous Norman steeds and other amphibious designs. According to William of Poitiers, Odo continued to play an important role after the Normans landed in late September by advising his brother not to march straight for London, but to ravage the surrounding territory, which in turn prompted King Harold's decision to face William earlier than he necessarily had to. Odo's specific role in Hastings itself is somewhat murky, he is famously depicted with a club in the work, most likely commissioned by him, the Bio Tapestry. One theory is that the club, sometimes referred to as a mace, was used due to church injunctions against clergymen using weapons, though abiding by such restrictions is somewhat out of place for this man. Odo, it appears, had no real qualms about wielding swords, as his personal seal depicts him both as a bishop with a crozier on one face, while on the other he is a knight astride his horse, armed with a sword and shield. Other accounts also have Odo fighting in battles with his sword. More likely perhaps is that Odo's club is actually a badge of rank, as Duke William himself is also shown to wield one, a fact that indicates Odo's high rank in the army at the battle as one of William's chief lieutenants and advisors. Whether or not Bishop Odo actually smashed any Saxon skulls that day with his club is disputable, 
No contemporary sources actually describe Odo as physically engaging any Englishman, though Wace wrote that William fought in the central battle or group, while Odo himself rode about to where the fighting was fiercest, lining up his knights and urging them into the fray. Yet whether or not Odo actually killed anyone that day is largely irrelevant, as he clearly played his part at the most dangerous points of the conflict that day. The tapestry, for example, shows that it was he who rallied fleeing cavalry when a rumour quickly spread through the Norman ranks that William had been killed. In truth, it was only the Duke's horse that had been felled, with William actually having three steeds killed under him that day. Odo then may have played the role of a rearguard or useful backup, plugging holes in Norman resolve when needed, and acting as he saw fit to bolster attacks or rally men when the need arose. William, as the victor of Hastings, was crowned king on Christmas Day 1066, and Odo was created Earl of Kent, as well as being gifted lands in the south and east of England. This appointment in itself emphasises William's great trust in Odo, given Kent was a strategic point of entry into England for any potential invader, and the lands he had been given were among the richest in the newly conquered land. Odo took his seat at Dover Castle, near the narrowest point between England and Europe. Odo's star continued to rise as his brother the king's enforcer. William returned to Normandy soon after his initial victories, placing Odo, along with the Earl of Hereford, William Fitzosburn, as co-regent in his absence. After Fitzosburn died in 1071, Odo assumed sole guardianship of England. It was during these periods that Odo gained his reputation as a kind of sub-king. Given William was absent for some three quarters of the time during his reign, Odo was effectively given a free hand in England. Odo's primary concern was to supervise the entrenchment of Norman rule, overseeing the construction of castles across the land, often through the use of Saxon forced labour. To this end, Odo, far from discouraging the behaviour of rampaging Norman lords who seized land and anything else they desired, he encouraged the terrorisation of the populace, thus earning himself a black reputation among the defeated English. In mid-1067, Odo dealt decisively with a rebellion in Kent itself, his brother the king perhaps feeling vindicated, placing him there. Odo was also instrumental in suppressing the so-called Revolt of the Earls, 1075, where it was not the English, but a group of Norman lords who attempted to wrest the crown from King William. In May of 1080, Odo brutally suppressed yet another revolt in Durham, which had begun with the murder of a royal sheriff and his staff. He held nothing back, ravaging the land while killing and mutilating men, often many not even involved in the rebellion itself. Bizarrely too, considering his status as a bishop, he even sacked the cathedral in Durham. The result was the same as other times, massive land confiscation and redistribution in the area itself, to the great benefit, of course, of Odo and his supporters. 1080 was a busy year for Odo in another way too, as he personally led Norman forces north along with Robert Curtos, his nephew and eldest son of King William. The campaign had two overarching goals, firstly to retaliate against Malcolm, the King of Scots, for his various raids into England, but also to reconcile Robert to his father, as the former had rebelled against the King. Indeed, Odo would remain a staunch supporter of his elder nephew till his own death, the duo were successful in bringing King Malcolm to Hill, extracting both a tribute from him and an oath of fealty to King William. However, Robert was still not reconciled to his father. Odo, Bishop of Bayeux and Earl of Kent, thus effectively ruled England as its king in all but name when the Conqueror was absent. However, his glory days were already numbered. There is wide consensus among the chroniclers of the time that Odo, despite his great responsibilities as regent,
was also lining his own pockets, vastly increasing his own wealth and power at any opportunity. Despite William's generous gifts of land and title in 1067, Odo had vastly expanded his power and holdings. In Kent alone, he controlled 184 vassals, that is, barons and knights, while also owning some 350 manors in 11 other counties. All this meant that by 1086, the Doomsday Book recorded Odo as far and away the wealthiest man in England, with only King William holding more land than he. But it was not merely avarice alone that singled him out. As the chief justiciary of England, he also blatantly used his office to favour his own supporters in disputes. Even fellow churchmen were not exempt from his attentions, as Alderic Vitalis writes. The character of this prelate was a compound of voices and virtues, but he was more occupied in worldly affairs than in the exercise of spiritual graces. The monasteries of the saints make great complaints of the injuries they received at the hands of Odo, who, with violence and injustice, robbed them of their funds, with which the English had piously endowed them in ancient times. It was perhaps his entanglements with the church that brought about his greatest and most bitter rivalry with a fellow churchman, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Lanfranc. It is possible that Odo wanted the office for himself, though even by this stage in 1070, William may have erred in increasing the power of his ambitious brother yet further, and instead elected to have Lanfranc replace the controversial Stigand as Archbishop. Lanfranc also held extensive lands in the Kent region. This perceived snub may be also spurring him on to deprive the Archbishop and his see of Canterbury of lands clearly belonging to them. However, unlike the trampled English, Odo could not so easily bully the Archbishop of Canterbury, who similarly had close ties to his brother, the King. In 1076, Odo was charged in a trial at Penedon Heath of both defrauding the Archbishop and the Crown. The tribunal ended with Odo being brought down a peg or two and having to cede lands back to Lamfranc. Odo's true fall from grace, however, came in 1082. While the exact point of conflict is unknown, it took the king himself to stamp out his brother's dangerous ambitions. Some scholars believe William was merely responding to the cascade of complaints about Odo's avarice and repressions, though Wace pinpoints a charge of embezzling royal funds. More interesting still, both Orderic Vitalis and William of Malmesbury, both writing independently, claim that Odo's ambition had soared to new heights, from independently organising a military expedition to Rome itself using William's own vassals. Odo, it seems, had cast covetous eyes on the papal throne. King William was informed of Odo's plans just in time, moving to capture his brother at the Isle of Wight before he could set sail. Cornered, Odo claimed that he was merely responding to a request from the Holy Roman Emperor for aid. However, when William informed him that he knew all about his plans to march on Rome, bribe local officials and replace the Pope with himself, he was probably temporarily stunned into silence. It is thought that Odo may have fully believed in a prophecy of a seer that stated that a man named Odo would unseat Pope Gregory VII. In Odo's mind, he likely believed that his expedition would receive some support from the Normans present in southern Italy too. William arrested Odo on the spot. William proceeded to put his overmighty brother on trial there and then, with the notable men of his retinue acting as the jury. He accused Odo of robbing churches of their funds and ornaments, of oppression of the people, and most importantly of all, to him, of betraying the king's trust and trying to launch a military campaign that would have left England weaker and deprived of men against any incursions from its various enemies. Even now, however, no man dared to condemn Odo, and so William himself sentenced him after finding him guilty and ordered his imprisonment. 
Perhaps to the conqueror's frustration, even still, no man moved to lay hands on the king's brother, and so the king himself did the deed, and placed his own half-brother in chains. Odo was said to have shouted that, as a cleric, he was immune from any secular prosecution. William bellowed back that he was not arresting a bishop, but imprisoning an earl, who he himself had created and set to rule in his absence. Odo was transferred to Rouen in Normandy, far from his allies and any hope of escape. And that should have been that. Odo languished in his brother's prison for some five years. Robert of Mortain, William's other half-brother, repeatedly pled for Odo's release, until by September 1087, the dying William reluctantly assented. It was one of King William's final acts. Odo was free again, and wasted next to no time, elbowing his way back into the centre of Anglo-Norman politics. Odo had always been close with Robert Curtos, his eldest nephew, but may have been surprised to learn that it was not he that gained rule of England, but the conqueror's younger son, William Rufus. Robert would succeed in Normandy, but not in England. Rufus confirmed Odo as Earl of Kent, but did not entrust his uncle with any of his old power. Likely unhappy at this, Odo, who was still very influential among the Norman elite, organised a rebellion against the new king in February of 1088. In the beginning, the conspiracy went well, with the wily old bishop recruiting his brother, Robert of Mortain, as well as several other powerful barons. The rebel base set at Rochester Castle, which was a new fortress that would have been extremely difficult to take by force. With his base secure, Odo then set about venting his rage on all those who opposed him, including the king's supporters. One old rival he had a particular eye for was Lanfranc, whose lands he paid special attention to in Kent. According to the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, Bishop Odo went to Kent and injured it severely, and he utterly laid waste to the king's land and the archbishops, and he carried all his goods into his castle in Rochester. Yet despite this vigorous start, the rebellion would be short-lived. In May, Odo made the mistake of riding to his brother Robert at Pevensey, with two of the revolt's leaders cooped up in one place. King William Rufus struck quickly, even mustering some feared men or Saxons under the promise of tax relief and other benefits before besieging his uncles there. The siege lasted some six weeks before Odo and Robert decided to surrender. Odo was forced to hand over Rochester Castle and was escorted back to the rebel headquarters by a group of his nephew's men. However, unbelievably, Odo still had dirty trick up his sleeve, as upon arriving at the castle, he somehow signalled to the gate guard that he was a prisoner, prompting the garrison to sally out and overwhelm the royal escort. Odo swiftly reneged on his agreement with Rufus to hand over the castle and city, enraging the king, who once again besieged his uncle, and, once again, forced his surrender. Odo and the rebels were allowed to ride out of the castle freely, to the evident anger of the men of Kent who wanted their blood. But the old man was also stripped of his earldom of Kent, his offices and land in England. Odo was still Bishop of Bayeux. He returned to Normandy to serve as his favourite nephew's advisor and chancellor, having failed to place Duke Robert on the throne. Even in these twilight years, however, Odo schemed and worked his will on his weak-willed nephew urging Robert to imprison his younger brother Henry for reconciling with their brother Rufus, perhaps earning him another dangerous enemy. Odo was still fond of playing the warlord too, leading an army in person that marched on Nentz and even taking a few castles before Duke Robert decided to end hostilities against his domestic foes. The sources around this time are quiet on Odo, which may indicate that he withdrew from public life at this point disappointed with his lot and the man he had so thoroughly supported. It is likely that, in these silent last years, he focused more on his first and only remaining office, 
his bishopric of Bayeux. Arguably his greatest physical legacy was stored and displayed here, most likely in his presence. The images depicting his glory days as the armoured cleric, rallying his brother's wavering forces at the battle that changed both his brothers and his own fortunes forever. The bio tapestry itself was almost certainly created in England by English seamstresses at Canterbury or elsewhere, commissioned by Bishop Odo in the days of his greatest power, soon after the conquest. Odo resurfaced a final time, 1095, at around the age of 65, at the Council of Clermont, where he headed the Norman delegation. It was here, of course, that the First Crusade was proclaimed. He then did his bit touring the duchy with a papal legate, a somewhat embarrassing time perhaps, giving his earlier, fanciful ambitions to be the Pope himself. One recruit was his nephew, Duke Robert, who probably tiring of the constant warring and politics with his brothers, desired to fight infidels instead. It's uncertain if the old bishop was moved to join the campaign through any guilt at the many atrocities and evils he had done, or maybe because he simply thirsted to campaign once more before the end. Another possible theory is that his presence was insisted upon, given his own character as an ambitious power player and his history with rebellion against his other nephew, King William Rufus. Duke Robert had, after all, financed his own plans by mortgaging his duchy to Rufus for 10,000 silver marks. The whole affair may be a complicated matter of convenience. Odo may have agreed to go, given his own history, but also to prevent Normandy fracturing into a hive of competing baronies when Robert went. Robert needed funds, and by this point, it may have been abundantly evident that William was the better ruler anyway, and could prevent this fracturing. This is all speculation, however. Odo, whatever the reasons for his departure with Robert, never made it to the holy city of Jerusalem. He died either of disease or exhaustion, though the exact location and time are disputed. His own Bayer Cathedral, the source, stated that he finally expired in January or February 1097 in Palermo, Sicily. Another closer source, William of Malmesbury, has a more suitably exciting ending for the great statesman, having him die in the besieged city of Antioch between June of 1098 and January 1099. Thus perished Odo, Bishop of Bayeux, companion and half-brother of William the Conqueror, cruel oppressor and wily conspirator, a man who schemed at the heart of Anglo-Norman politics for well over half a century. Odo's central role cannot be denied, even if he was a thoroughly unpleasant man. His involvement in the planning stages of William's invasion of England, his crucial, if disputed, supporting role at the Battle of Hastings itself, as well as his harsh, even cruel rule as regent in the 1060s and 70s, highlights him as a key figure in early Norman England. His effectiveness as a leader and advisor clearly endeared him to his much more famous brother, the Conqueror, who clearly saw him as a strategic thinker and talented follower, worthy of his trust, especially during his more vulnerable years as a young duke, and even after his initial years as king. However, any virtues the king thought he had were offset by his many vices, his infinite ambitions, his avarice, and his almost unsurpassed cruelty. But what do you think? Was Odo an effective ruler of men, thrust into his role as a cruel lieutenant out of necessity? Would some other Norman follower have acted similarly anyway? Or was Odo a devious and fundamentally flawed man, driven by his greed and lust for power? Let us know in the comments, and we shall see you in the next video.